life of Dunstan, one of the most famous of all of England's Christian spiritual leaders, um, born in 909 uh, in Glastonbury, southwest part of England. Dunstan was famous for being a man of extraordinary and multitudinous talent, but his example says something more than just somebody who knows how to do things like cast gorgeous church bells, illuminate manuscripts, and all the other things for which he was known in terms of his talent. I'm looking more carefully at the example of the man. Dunstan grew up in the midst of a family of privilege, and the assumption is that Dunstan would take up a life in royal court. And so, after dutifully being trained and mentored, he was sent off to court, and it was very clear from the very beginning to Dunstan that he did not fit in. The intrigue, the political maneuvering, the capacity to be able to think politically about your relationships, everybody trying to curry favor with royalty, he couldn't stand it. And he got out wisely, early, young. And it, was, and it was in the midst of that that his life actually began to open up. Um, God connected him with his uncle, who was the Bishop of Westminster, talked to him about a calling to ordination. Um, in the midst of a time when monasticism had all been destroyed because of the Viking raids, he established a little hut, literally on the ruins of a monastery, and began to ply a life of prayer. And out of that life of prayer, came the extraordinary flourishing of what we now know about Dunstan. Not only a talented man of the arts, but literally someone who had the courage to publicly challenge a king over his unchastity, someone who had the creativity to write the, the liturgy for the coronation of a new king that is still used in some form to this day. I mean, the list is like this. So what's the message of Dunstan? The message of Dunstan is, stop trying to fit in if it's not who you are. And what I mean by it is this. Paul advises us in the epistle to be wise about how you live and not unwise. And the symptoms that he gives us for the fact that we are not living wisely, we have a tendency to separate into a particular kind of moral category. Because he says, don't get drunk, for that's debauchery, etc., etc., etc. As if to say, so long as I keep myself clean from those things, I'm doing fine. I don't think that's Paul's point. Instead, what I would want to say is, if the excesses of dissipation that he lists are a part of your life, it could be indicative of a kind of inner conflict that is, should be telling you that you're not living wisely. And that, in fact, the purpose for your life could be found in something that you are not doing. And therefore, there's this hunger inside of you to become that is, in fact, being stifled by the desire to fit in. If there is anything that I would consider foolish living, is living at cross purposes for the very reasons that God made you, the way he formed you. And it was only after Dunstan stepped out of that arena where he clearly knew, I'm not wired for this kind of life, that all of his life began to open up. God had his hand in that transition because England desperately needed strong, courageous leaders to, in fact, bring about what became a whole new flourishing of Christian England through his and others' leadership. They didn't have that because the Vikings had all but destroyed the team. Dunstan was needed. In our day, our society needs the same kind of leaders, and especially our church. We are seen as so predictable, it is worthy of satire. And it is exactly because of that reason that it's indicative to me of a lot of people who are, quite frankly, trying to fit in and are living at cross purposes for the real reasons that God made them. I was listening this morning on YouTube to a video, that, a lecture that Rowan Williams gave. 
and he cited an Australian humorist. I want to make sure I get it right. His name is Michael Lunick. And he said that Michael was telling a story in one of his collections about how he first began to learn about God. So the first time he actually actually heard God's name was in casual <coughs> conversations with his parents, but not in the way that you and I would ima imagine. It would be his father yelling in the backyard, where in God's name is my hammer? <laughs> and his mother going, God only knows. <laughs> he said, that taught me something. It captured my attention. That God must be this incredibly important, mysterious being. In fact, he even goes so far as to say, God is a one-word poem. He said, but when I got into classes in preparation for confirmation, I found a very different God being presented. Not wondrous and mysterious, a, a one-word poem, but instead a kind of very predictively boring character. If that's how God is presented, more often than not, it's presented that way by people who aspire to fitting in. In other words, predictively boring lives. Because that's the kind of God they need to, in essence, live perhaps even at cross purposes with the very particular way that they were made. God knows we don't need a predictively boring church or a predictively boring set of church leaders. We need men and women who are willing to have the courage to become who God has made them, even at great personal cost, often, quite frankly, at great personal cost, so that in that kind of flourishing, they begin to present a God who is as wondrous and as magnificent, as unpredictable and full of love as we see in Jesus of Nazareth. Because inevitably, the predictably boring God doesn't look like Jesus at all, who continued to shock and astound people at every turn. I'm looking for churches that astound. Because that's worthy of our God. So when we think about Dunstan, don't just think gorgeous manuscripts and church bells. Think about a man who had the courage to say yes to who God was making him. And say, as we sang, Great Jehovah, form our hearts. Don't let me do it and make them bow. Amen. Amen.